Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CRC's webinar on community of practice. I'd like to introduce the panelists for today. My name is Tali Vardy. I'm the Executive Director of the Coral Restoration Consortium, and you'll be hearing today from some of my amazing, smart, funny colleagues that I am so thankful for their willingness to present with me. Um, Michelle and Jessica are the coordinators for the CRC, and Dave and Nathan are both advisory board members. We're having them tag team. They're both in Saudi Arabia, where it's a very strange time right now. Um, so thank you all. Um, and you'll be hearing from each one of us throughout the next hour. So the flow of today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the CRC. You can learn about kind of who we are, if you're brand new, and where we're going, if you are familiar with us. And we'll be going over the survey results and explaining a few ways that you can get involved with the CRC. And we're gonna have plenty of time for questions. So please do um, enter your questions into the question box. You can just enter it as you think of it. You don't have to wait. And we will be um, answering the questions at the end of the webinar once we've all spoken. So first we'd like to get to know who is on the call today and so we have um three quick polls um to get started so we want to know what brought you to this webinar um maybe you just learned about us maybe you're already familiar and you want to know where we're headed um maybe you want to get involved with the crc or maybe you're just curious about coral restoration and looking to learn more things Thank you, guys. It's really exciting to see the numbers going up here. Awesome. We'll give it just a couple more seconds, Michelle, and then I believe the results get put up. Looks like most of you are familiar with the CERC and want to know what's new. And about 20% of you are just learning about the CRC and are curious to know where we're headed. And then the rest are in those bottom categories. So this is great. Go ahead, Michelle. We can move to the second one, I think. Great, so did you take the CRC survey of restoration practitioners is the next question. This is a simple yes, no, probably should go pretty quick. And if you're not sure, maybe you haven't heard of it, that's totally fine too. Awesome, oh, that is amazing. So about 20% did and about 70% did not and that's, Pretty much what you expect of a survey, you pretty much expect a 20% response rate. So this is actually just right on target. Great, thanks, Michelle. Let's do the last question. And thank you all for bearing with us. It really helps us to know who's in the audience. These one-way styles of communication are kind of tough. So what coral region do you identify with most closely? So this could either be where you live, where you are, um, where you work, if you work in multiple places and really don't have one particular area, you don't have to fill it out. But if you have one that you're closely aligned with, just choose that one, choose the best one. And don't be dissuaded that we are not a global group, but this is always based on our time zone. Um, so we're having another one of these in about um, 14 hours, and we'll probably get the other half of the world. Great, that looks about like 100%. Okay, thank you so much. I think we're ready to move on. Awesome. Okay, so who is the CRC? Um, who are we and where do we work? And apologies. So we are the community of practice for coral restoration. And what exactly is a community of practice? It's a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. There are about 200 coral restoration organizations throughout the world, 
put together here in this beautiful map by Adriana Santa Cruz Castro. We built the CRC so you all could learn from one another, improve your practices, and that thereby increase the scale of impact for restoration globally. That was really our motivation. So in short, if you are a coral restoration practitioner or you're related to coral restoration in some way through science management or some other way, education, you are a part of this community and we welcome you and we are really here to serve you. Next slide. And what exactly do we do? Besides being a convening body, a global convening body, we also have sub communities of practice where we work on specific topics in specific regions and we come together in person at ReFutures every couple of years. But primarily for the past six years, we have really been focused on developing products that really elevate the state of play for coral restoration. We have an online course on coral restoration that really gives you the basics of where to start. And we have done that for the past couple of years with the help, I'm sorry, in partnership with the Reef Resilience Network. And we are working this year to update that course. So that's been a wonderful collaboration. There's seven, seven separate units and it's a great place to start if you're at the beginning of your coral restoration journey. We have over 80 webinars on our website, including a lot of ReFutures content. We've developed comprehensive guidance on monitoring coral restoration via all sorts of methods, um, predicting spawning for corals, how to do field-based restoration, and how to predict coral bre breeding, along with specific data templates for all of those things. Um, we've also gathered and reviewed the science in particular aspects of coral restoration and written scientific papers. And I'll say that 99% of this work has been done really as a labor of love by volunteers in our working groups. This is just the community coming together and realizing this is the state of knowledge, this needs to be shared broadly as the field is exploding. So this has really been a very minimally funded um, group effort for the past um, few years. Next slide. So when did we begin and, and why? So we really began in 2017, right at the tail end of a workshop that we organized just for the Caribbean to get scientists and practitioners organized and communicating, and even practitioners communicating with each other in the Caribbean in 2016. Meanwhile, the oceans were boiling, the land was on fire, it was an El Nino um, event and there was mass bleaching in really so-called pristine areas of, of the world's oceans. And this is really the time that restoration went from being kind of one of the things that you would do in an acute setting, um, if you had a ship grounding or you were kind of doing some endangered species um, management, and then it went from like, how are we going to save the world's reefs in this era of, of global warming and mass bleaching? And it really started to become something that people thought about in all corners of the reefs. So why now? Why are we doing this webinar now? Well, we're actually in another El Nino year, as probably everybody on this call knows. We are experiencing a mass um, bleaching and a global warming event um, again. In, um, it was happening in the Caribbean this past summer, and it's still happening in many places in the Caribbean. And now it's wrapping its way into the South Pacific and the, in the austral summer. Um, just this week, um, we have bleaching alert level two throughout the South Pacific and in the Western Indian Ocean. And in the coming months, it just looks like no reef will go unaffected. So we're really in this new era of coral reef conservation where the, the strategies of yesterday do not look like the strategies of today and they will not look like those of tomorrow. We really are in kind of an ecological emergency here. And this community is more important than ever because we just don't have time to reinvent the wheel. We have to learn from each other and we have to be there for each other when we need to know what techniques work and where we have piloted them. So that's um, the big why of why we exist. 
And now I'm going to get into the how. Um, so we do this collaboratively, not just within our organization, but also externally. There are so many different groups. It probably can be quite confusing to the uninitiated. A lot of um, acronyms out here. But if you just if you start clicking through, you can see that the the groups actually fall into some pretty neat little categories. So ICRS has been around since at least 1980 and is really the academic institution. We have international coordination led by ICRI. Um, we really focus on implementation and there's new groups, CORDAP and GFCR, that are really focused on the essential element of funding this ecological emergency and how we might be able to get out of it. Um, that's really how we're focused externally. And these groups, I'll say there's many, many, many more groups. These are not the only groups. These are the ones that are international and really focused um, on, in, on coral restoration as at least a large portion of what they do or a significant portion of what they do. Now, internally, we had a structure um, for the past six years. We were led by a steering committee with co-chairs. We, and we had the lines of work that we still have today, regional groups, working groups, re futures. And, um, and you can see the kind of lines of communication and how we operated were not super clear. And so um, about a year and a half ago, or maybe a little bit more, maybe about two years ago, next slide, please. The steering committee voted to change our structure to something that enabled our organization to grow to fit this need, um, this ecological emergency that we're in. Um, so we are now structured with a board of directors and an advisory board. And each one of these circles that has an outline around it means that there's somebody in charge, a person in charge of that group or that line of work. And that really enables us to grow and meet the challenges at hand. And um, once we developed this new structure in um, basically the sum, uh, about six months ago, we um, developed a strategic plan from that. And that strategic plan is based around three goals. Those three goals are to listen to what coral restoration practitioners need, to really open up our ears for that, to elevate the practice of coral restoration. And again, this is by providing products, um, webinars, guides, et cetera. And finally, to share stories to connect the community. And this is what we do within our groups and our futures and in other formats. And we realized that the listening is what we hadn't really done in a methodical way to date. We knew there was a lot to do. We wanted to provide a, little, a lot of information, but we really wanted to listen methodically. And as such, this November, we held a survey and Nathan has popped on here and he's going to tell you a bit about what we heard from you. So thanks, Nathan. <clears throat> thanks, Tali. Yeah, so we had this online survey for a couple of weeks throughout November and we received 225 complete responses, which was a really positive response rate. Um, those people came from, and as Tali mentioned, one of the things that we were interested in is advancing the practice of restoration and sharing that knowledge. And so rather than assuming we knew the answer to that question, you know, we conducted this survey and we got a really good response. We were aiming for getting managers and practitioners and 85% of the 225 respondents were identified as being from this cohort. So we feel like we hit that target really well. Uh, a wide variety of different organizations, as it shows there, 206. And it was our first go at attempting a survey like this. And there are you know, cle clearly areas of improvement, but we feel like um, as a first go, it's been really good to help start guide the direction of the CRC into the needs of practitioners. So I'm just gonna walk through some of the, the high level results um, and just share what we learned um, and how it's potentially gonna drive some of our um, future development. So we started by trying to find out what 
were some of the local issues people were facing in different places. And you can see from this graph, you know, this was a, a scale on one to, from zero to 10, from least important to most important. And you can see on a global scale, there's not a lot of variation from um, coastal development, land-based pollution, overfishing, destructive fishing at the bottom of that scale. It's quite generic. And so we found that um, didn't tell us much until we started to break it down into the regions and try and get local with some of these issues because as we know, localized issues are always relative, often linked, if you can go to the next slide for us, please, Jess, and likely compounding. You know, for example, 50, over 50% 50 of respondents listed coastal development and land-based pollution as a major issue. Um, but the latter, the land-based pollution, may be as a result of the former. You know, similarly, imbalanced ecological dynamics and overfishing potentially have linkages. So we really need to drill down into some of these localised issues um, to really understand exactly how we can assist restoration practitioners and managers around the world. One of the things that you know, destructive fishing practices in South Asia, for example, didn't feature very highly, even though historically it's been quite a quite a, a significant problem. You know, and maybe this is because of it's less of an issue with more education these days, or maybe it's been overtaken by things like coastal development and tourism. So um, really interesting information and certainly things that we can unpack, especially as we get down into regional areas, which we're going to speak about in a little bit. So we were talking about listening to the needs of our community and we came to find out what the top four needs were. And there were clearly four that stood out head and shoulders above the others. And it's interesting, out of these top four needs highlighted, two of them uh, have a strong ecological focus and two of them have a, a strong social focus, you know, looking at. So it's clear from the survey data that communications and getting the story out into the community was a common need or desire amongst a lot of the respondents, which is really exciting because in this day and age of social media and very confusing communication sometimes, you know, this is really good to hear, but it's exciting because it aligns with uh, the CRC storytelling hub, which I'm sure Tali will talk about in a little bit. The communications piece links well with another need to coordinate more with restoration organisations within local regions. And again, our regional coordinator, Jess Levy, will go further into how the CRC is going to address this need going forward. But when we look at the what people wanted to learn about from the CRC, there was two clear standouts. And overall, practitioners wanted to know what are the latest restoration methods and techniques that are being practiced around the world? And how can organizations scale up their practices to meet these ecological scale goals? It felt like these two concepts or learning needs feed into other areas of interest that were also highlighted. So you can see the two circled areas there in yellow, you know, the desire to incorporate sexual reproduction methods into projects potentially combines well with land-based components, likely reflecting, you know, a desire to incorporate sexual reproduction methods and potentially look at that challenge of scale. Similarly, the introduction of artificial reefs as a part of restoration techniques was also desired and potentially hits those two clear top learning goals. Interestingly though as well, building and maintaining coral nurseries was at the low end of the needs for our community. And I imagine that a lot of people on this call have been involved with building coral nurseries and um, in situ uh, setups. And so it's probably something that most people feel relatively competent and comfortable with. And so it's not surprising that well, it is a little bit surprising, but nice to hear that we're looking for more advanced techniques um, to align with the, the challenges that we're looking uh, ahead to, as Tali mentioned, throughout the introduction. One of the things the CRC has been quite um, productive at over the last few years is, is producing products and publications. This includes both um, guidelines and as well as peer-reviewed publications. 
So we asked a few questions in the survey about how people, um, how many people have been reading or using these products and how many people have found them useful. So what you see on this slide, this is looking at the guides, things like the monitoring guide, the bleaching guidance, a spawning prediction calendars. And what that graph is showing you that the number on the left is the number of people out of the 225 that uh, responded, the number of people that read them. So for example, the monitoring guide was around 150. But the percentage there is out of that 150, how many people found it useful? for their organisation and it was great to see that these percentages were really high for all of these guides, which gives us the knowledge that these products are worth investing the time and effort into to make sure they get out into the community. So that was really positive. Um, you know, one of the things that isn't on the slide here, but we did ask separately was, what do you why what makes guides or publications really useful and two of the things that we were told were if they were written in plain language with a step-by-step -step guidance which a lot of these guides are and contain multiple descriptive graphics and so it feels like we're hitting the mark with those conversely with peer-reviewed publications the feedback was well as we like to say in, used to say in thailand same same but different um, high, high uh, value from those that read it, but you'll see that the number of readers in the left-hand column in the y-axis was much lower than the guides, which is not really um, surprising. Uh, Peer-reviewed publications can be a little dense to read at times, and so they tend to hit a more niche um, specific market or people looking for specific information. But it was great to see that, again, the percentages across the board about those that read those papers and found them useful uh, was really high. And so that gives us um, the knowledge to know that these products are valuable and that we should continue to work to share the knowledge through both of these um, avenues. We talked about uh, the focus on regionality and how important it is for engaging in creating a community of practice around the key strategic goals of the CRC. And so you can see from this gra graph both collectively, globally, as well as individually through the different regions that creating uh, regional groups was a really uh, strong desire. And it was consistent. And just in a moment, when I finish talking, I'll pass over to Jess, who's gonna talk more about this. The desire for regional groups is, uh, is great. Having been a former coordinator of one myself, uh, it is important to remember that community engagement and support is critical for these to be successful. So you can have a, a, a somebody who's passionate um, set up a regional group, but they're only worthwhile if you get diverse groups of people participating and that the group itself has a focus or objective. You know, so these objectives and goals need to be considered carefully in the development process. You know, there's no point having meetings for meetings sake. And again, as, we, as we've noted from um, the, the top needs, a lot of it was communications focused. So what did we learn from the survey and, and how do we move forward from this? We're gonna look at developing products and services support to support the community. So things like expanding the product range to suit practitioners' needs, developing webinars from latest techniques to enhance capacity. You know, these are the things that we've been asked for. Developing the storytelling oh, yeah. hub that I mentioned briefly a moment ago and generating greater support in the promotion and development of, of those regional groups, which is a really good segue to Jess Levy, because she's going to tell you a lot more about those regional groups. Take it away, Jess. Thanks, Nathan. Perfect. Just like we planned it. Um, all right. So I wanted to start by calling up this graphic again, which you saw earlier when Tally started the introduction of the webinar. Um, I really like this graphic because it just shows how active this field has become and how active it is. We're seeing more and more um, practices and programs spring up around the world, investing in coral restoration efforts. We're seeing existing 
programs want to scale up and increase their impact and increase their capacity as well. And this is really, you know, the purpose of the CRC or its um, its niche is recognizing that the best way to push this field forward, to grow capacity, to grow restoration efforts um, is to promote greater connectivity and coordination of the work at hand. Um, and it's these continued shared learning experiences and continued access to new information, what's working, what's not, what are people trying, um, that has an immense amount of power to really push this field forward um, versus recreating the wheel and, and staying siloed. And we've always known this and we've always promoted regional um, connections and collaborations over the years, but in different ways and in different uh, capacities. Um, to Nathan's point, every place is very unique and very different and has different motivations behind their restoration and, and their challenges and the work at hand. Um, but to date, we've had very active regional groups or chapters based out of Australia, the Eastern Tropical Pacific, and the Caribbean as well. Um, but if we just zoom out from this map, there's the world's a big place and there are some obvious gaps when we just sit and look at this at face value. Um, this is something that I think the CRC has always known and we've always acknowledged that there are these gaps and there are rooms for improvement um, on behalf of the side of the CRC. But what we were not sure if it was a true need that needed to be filled or it was just an assumption that we were having behind closed doors, um, which is why those survey results were one of the things that was so exciting about them um, was to see that nearly every single region said that either sharing their story and or coordinating with others within their region was among the top three generalized needs for a given area. Um, so that just kind of helped to reaffirm that we're on the right track, there is purpose here, there is a need here, um, and that becomes that much more important, particularly when we take a step back and look at just how big the challenge we have at hand, and by challenge I mean protecting and restoring reefs um, and coral reef communities as well, because it becomes not only about the corals as individual animals and the reef community and the health of the reef, but it also becomes about those people that rely on those reef communities. It becomes about us as individuals, community of practice, and to steal a line from Nathan from a couple of months ago, this work is about the people um, and our ability to support each other, learn from each other and grow together. Um, definitely not an easy task for sure, and it's quite daunting. So what I want to talk about next is just kind of how we've started to rethink this process and go about trying to have more regional engagements and greater representation in the restoration space around the world. So just at a very general look first, um, we've loosely defined a region um, using the boundaries of the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network. And this is just as a guide, totally recognize that there are a lot of caveats here and there could, and these are big areas um, and it may make a lot of sense in some places to parse them down to, to be a little bit more detailed based on either languages or time differences. Um, GCRMN just, it, it's a good starting point. Um, and then some more generalities that we're working on, wanting to understand existing regional coordinate, coordination efforts, what they are, where they sit, who's their audience, what the purpose is. Um, anything that we do moving forward, obviously we want it to be complementary and not duplicative for the existing work that's going on. Um, so once we try to understand the landscape, then it's about also identifying what is the given need for a region or multiple needs and ever and, and ways to foster greater connections among restoration practitioners. Um, the success of location of restoration is very location specific. 
which means that there's not going to be one size fits all model for how to generate and maintain these groups. Um, so we completely recognize that and like what Nathan was saying, we want this to be for those in the water day in day out doing the work and driven by them and what would be most helpful to them. Um, the other side of this is also coming from the survey. We heard that not only do people want to learn within these regions, but they also want to be able to show their work outwardly. So there's also this desire to have kind of a within region and between regions shared experiences and the ability to talk about um, the efforts at hand where I think the story hub, which you'll hear about in a, in a minute, will really come into play. Um, and then just some more concrete actions for the coming year. Um, we're hopeful that the first couple of new regional groups uh, that come online will be representing the Pacific Islands, the Western Indian Ocean, and uh, a revamp or a revision of the Australian chapter. Um, this is the slide. This is by no means an exclusionary list. Um, these are just the three areas where most recently the CRC has been approached by folks locally in these regions um, that want to start something and be a part of something within their area. Um, because this really does only work if it is, if there's local buy-in and if it's driven by the people working in these locations that know their reef systems like the back of their hand. Um, for the Pacific Islands, we've tentatively identified a chair and a co-chair for this working group. We're currently working um, to, with a small subgroup to articulate what the greatest knowledge needs is and use that information to develop a, a group of practitioners and support learning exchanges between those practitioners and between the islands um, within this region. For the Western Indian Ocean, um, we're working to find ways to show and highlight the community-led efforts through the Storytelling Hub, as well as working to gain a greater understanding of the existing efforts um, and the potentials for collaborations there. And then with Australia, um, we've been in talks with uh, folks from RRAP and AIMS um, and just having some discussions around how to revise the Australian Working Group. Um, and just continuing to look for support in these efforts. Um, before I hand this over, um, I just wanna say this is a big job. It's not anything that one person or one organized or one organization could do successfully. Um, if you have an interest in helping out the CRC, becoming more involved, this is a growing area and there's a lot of great opportunity there. Um, so I would just leave you with a shameless plug that if you're interested to shoot me an email because I would love to start talking with you. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Michelle to talk about even more fun in-person opportunities for us. Thanks, Jess. Um, hi, everybody. I am Michelle Lowe. I'm one of the coordinators of the CRC as well as one of the coordinators of ReFutures. Um, so speaking of ReFutures, it's happening this year, uh, December 9th to 13th in Mexico. And uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in case you don't know what ReFutures is, it is a global symposium that's presented by the CRC about every two years. It is a conference that's dedicated solely to coral restoration and anyone who is interested or involved in coral restoration is invited and encouraged to attend. Um, ReFutures brings together restoration practitioners, researchers, students, engineers, and resource managers from all around the world uh, for a week of dynamic presentations, workshops, and networking. Um, in 2022, we had over 600 attendees and we expect even more for ReFutures 2024. Um, another insight um, from Nathan's survey, um, or the practitioner survey that Nathan presented on um, regarding ReFutures was that 77% of respondents who have attended a ReFutures said that the conference made an impact in their restoration practice. Um, and we expect that rate to grow as the conference continues to grow. So that was very exciting to see. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so for Reef Futures 2024, the CRC has partnered with a Bureau Star Group's Wave of Change as the local host. Uh, the Wave of Change movement is centered around responsible tourism with goals toward elimination of single-use plastics, uh, implementation of nature-based solutions, and responsible seafood consumption. The conference will be held in the Riviera Maya region of Mexico uh, in the state of Quintana Roo at a Bureau Stars Paraiso Conference and Hotel Complex. The goals of the Wave of Change movement are implemented at this location, at the conference complex and the surrounding hotels. So you'll be able to see their commitment to sustainability in action at the conference. Next slide, please. Uh, the large complex, excuse me, has a conference center and three hotels on the property. Um, and in partnership with the Wave of Change program, we've secured amazing rates at the property. And we have a block of over 500 rooms, um, which is larger than we've been able to have in the past um, ReFutures conferences. And we expect all attendees uh, who are not local to be able to stay on the property. Um, in addition to that, uh, the overall cost for participants is expected to be lower than it was for ReFutures 2022, and registration fees will also not be raised. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, okay, so then the schedule for the week. Uh, the primary program for ReFutures 2024 will be slightly different than it has been in previous years. Um, the main program will run for um, the five days of the week, like Monday through Friday, and the workshops, which have traditionally been in the beginning and end of ReFutures, will actually be interspersed throughout the week uh, to break up the content and give everyone plenty of time for side meetings. So plan to attend um, for the full week. Next slide, please. And then the timeline, um, at least for the next few months, we expect the call for abstracts to open in mid-February and close in April. And then we expect that early registration um, will open sometime in March, um, and that will be open for at least a couple of months. And then it will go to general registration. Thanks, Jess. Um, and then we also um, expect to be able to have scholarships again for ReFutures. Uh, we were able to have a really robust program for ReFutures 2022. And with the help of our generous sponsors, we hope to be able to do that again for ReFutures 24. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, speaking of sponsors, um, we are currently looking for sponsors for ReFutures 2024. So if your organization or anyone you know is interested in becoming a sponsor, uh, please reach out to refutures at crc.world. Additionally, um, if you yourself are interested in taking on a leadership role in the planning for ReFutures, please also reach out to refutures at crc.world. Um, and keep an eye on your email for updates from ReFutures about abstracts opening, travel and registration information, and much more. Thank you, everyone. And I will pass it back to Tally to announce the winners of the ReFutures registrations. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I'm getting excited for ReFutures already. Um, so as an incentive um, for you all to complete the survey, we offered a random drawing of five people to receive free registration for ReFutures in 2024. And my I couldn't do it live because I don't have like a big lotto machine behind me, but we did um, use a random number generator in our survey spreadsheet. And we came up with this beautiful list of diverse participants from Australia, the US, the British Virgin Islands, Guam, and Kuwait. Um, you'll see a nice mix of restoration practitioners, researchers, and managers. So we will be getting in touch with these five people in the coming weeks. Um, and we have your emails. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. 225 responses for a sur survey really exceeded my expectations. And um, I really appreciate everyone doing it. And congratulations to these winners. So I just want to spend the last few minutes, as you guys are thinking of your questions, I already see some excellent questions coming in. Um, I just want to spend the last few minutes talking about other ways that you can get involved with the CRC. 
And of course, we are always all ears to learn about new ways. I just want to tell you about some of the existing ways that we have. So we have five different working groups. I'm just going to feature two here. Um, because one of the survey responses um, that Nathan went over before is um, was that the one of the top learning needs that people are interested in is learning about new techniques for coral restoration, right? Everybody wants to learn how we can do restoration even better, even faster, and even more successfully. And our engineering and innovation group is led by Brooke Elzweig, and they host quarterly meetings, which you can sign up for. You can follow us on social media or sign up directly for their email list. Um, they also host a ReFutures showcase if you have innovations that you want to show. And there's a new database where we can feature your innovation called CoralTech.World that we are getting up and running right now, also on our website. Another example of one of our working groups is the Cryopreservation Working Group. This year, they're working on expanding the global network of cryobanks throughout the world. And the chair of that group is Virginia Weiss. You can get in touch with her. We will, of course, put all these emails also in the follow-up um, in case you're not getting them. And they're on my last slide. So in case you don't get them, they'll be up there again. And next slide. Another way to get involved is the advisory board of the CRC. This is really the group that helps steer the CRC in the direction that it needs to go in and to be aware of all the global issues that are affecting reefs. Um, this advisory board is co-led by Joe Pollack from the Nature Conservancy and the vice chair is Virginia Weiss also from our cryopreservation working group. And we're gonna be having a call for new members in the next couple of weeks. Um, so definitely look out for that. We're really looking to diversify our advisory board with regional expertise from areas that we have not traditionally been strong in in the CRC. So that's East and South Asia, Western Indian Ocean, and the Central and South Pacific. We're also looking to round out our subject matter expertise with indigenous knowledge, management and policy experience, as well as stakeholder engagement, ethics and socioeconomics. So we're really, really looking forward to hearing from you. If you're interested in serving on the advisory board, there will be nominations, nomination forms available. If you wanna learn more about the advisory board itself, the terms of reference are now on our website in the advisory board section so you can learn a little bit more about what it means to be an advisory board member and what kind of commitment is involved. Um, next slide. Yes, and our overwhelming need from the survey that everybody wanted to um, do, well, not everybody, I guess, it was, but more than 60% of the 225 people wanted to share their story, which I think is a really resounding number. Um, so we designed this storytelling hub on our website that's a little bit small now, but it's growing. And we really are thinking about it as a place, a repository of reef restoration stories throughout the, throughout the world. We have developed this citizen documentary series um, PDF. It's, I think, an eight to 10 page PDF that really explicitly guides you through making a video. And then on our end, we have editors and producers that we are working with to create these videos for you or for your organization. So you can use them as your own promotional kind of um, material. And then we help you um, share your story on our website and through our social media. So we launched this at COP28 um, at the end of November or early December. Um, and it's just really exciting. The videos are really sweet. I encourage you to go out and look at them. And if you're interested in doing one, please just get in touch um, with comms at crc.world. And we're always um, interested in, in getting more of these. So I'll just, before we get to the questions, we have 15 minutes now for questions. I'm just going to close out with some reminders of what we talked about here today um, and really the direction that we're going in for 2024. Our three goals are listed here. And in 2024, we plan to listen specifically, um, globally, but specifically to regional needs in the Western Indian Ocean and Pacific. That's a place that we're really focused on this year. Um, and we're gonna be listening globally to what the community is telling us through ReFutures content submissions in the next few months. That's where we're gonna be learning about where the pulse is, what people want to talk about in person. 
next December. We'll be elevating the field of coral restoration by publishing a field-based guide in the next couple of months. We'll be developing a webinar series based on the survey and the needs that you articulated to us. And we will be figuring out ways to help you all process the grief that's associated with coral bleaching and the environmental disasters that are surrounding us. It's no joke, it's very difficult, and in order to keep doing what we're doing and to do it smartly, we really have to take time out to do that. That's something I benefited from um, this past summer, and I'd really like to bring that in to um, our community. Finally, we'll be sharing by publishing these survey results. We're not quite sure yet how. These are, again, quite preliminary. The survey only closed at the end of November, and we've um, we just shared with you kind of what we have so far, but we'll be digging more into them and publishing them in some way. Um, we're excited to share with new advisory board members, grow the storytelling hub, and we're excited to share every future's course. So next slide. I'd just like to acknowledge our steadfast funders, NOAA and the Coral Restoration Foundation. Without these two groups, the CRC would be nowhere. NOAA has funded us from the very beginning and CRF was hot on its tails. Um, of course, there are many, 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 many people and groups that have given so much in-kind support. In fact, I, I would assume that 90% of what we've done is through in-kind support. Um, we are definitely looking for additional ways to keep this community together, more funding, more resources, more volunteers. Um, we have significant challenges ahead of us and um, we're excited to take those challenges and we're just looking to grow. And I do wanna take a minute and thank our comm specialists that we've had for the past six months. If any of you are on social media, um, you've probably seen her posts. She's been such a huge help to me as I've started in this role and such a great supporter of the CRC. We would not be where we are today without her. Sarah Worcester has been our communications person for the past six months and she is moving on starting a painting school in New York City. I'm so excited for her and I'm so grateful for all the help that she's offered to the CRC. So I'm gonna leave um, we're going to move on to the questions, and I'm just going to leave this slide up um, because we gave you a lot of different ways to be involved and a lot of different um, methods and people to contact. Um, info at crc.world always works, but you'll get a faster response if you contact um, one of the emails here specifically. So thank you all for your attention, and I do see that we have several questions. Um, if I remember correctly, Michelle is going to be choosing a question and reading it out loud. Sure, Tally. Yeah, so we have some really good questions here. Um, I have one for you that I think will work here. Um, so this one is has a couple of parts. Um, one, okay, sorry, let me let me do this easy one first. Um, so this one says, I'm relatively new to coral research and I'm looking for ways to help and learn and get involved. Is there anything that you suggest? And I would say we can start with Tally and then Nathan or Jess, if you have anything to add, I think you guys probably have great perspective as well. Yeah, well, first of all, welcome. Um, and there's lots of ways to get involved. Um, I think the best place for people to start out if they're just learning about coral restoration is to take the online course and really kind of learn the ins and outs of the different techniques. And then there are lots of ways to volunteer with our groups, with refutures. Um, there's, there's a myriad of ways. So um, I just encourage you to, if you're looking to get involved with us, those are some of the ways. And if you're looking to get involved in the field, um, Nathan and Jessica probably have a few more specific um, recommendations for you. Yeah, I guess I'd just say that, um, you know, there's nothing beats getting out in the field and having some hands-on practice. So just looking for environmental groups in your area that might be doing restoration or may not be doing restoration, but may be able to help you on a path to finding those groups that are doing that. You know, whether they're doing a beach cleanup or something like that, they might have contacts with restoration groups that might be a little more difficult to access sometimes, but just getting out, networking, and finding out what's happening in your area. And yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Just, you can always come and join me and help with the regional groups. <laughs> and I promise we'll get you in the field. 
Thanks, guys. Okay, um, I will have the next question. Um, Tally, I think you could probably tackle this one. Um, a, this is related to your presentation about the online restoration course, the mentored online course. And the question is, um, is there any academic or national accreditation of the course, something that would be recognized in the global workforce? Hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, the core, the online course that we have does have a certificate at the end. Um, who recognizes that and how, I don't really know, um, but there is an official certificate if you complete the course. Um, for something a little higher level, there is the Society for Ecological Restoration has a certified ecological restoration practitioner course. Um, that is general to all, all types of ecosystems. We are in conversation with the Society for Ecological Restoration to develop a course for coral reef restoration specifically, but that is not quite yet available. Um, but when it is, you'll certainly hear about it from us. <laughs> Thank you, Tally. Um, Jess, this next question is a little bit related to the field-based guide. So I'm going to pass it to you, but um, it also has to do a little bit with larval propagation. So I think maybe in your answer, you can go as far as, um, you know, what the field-based group is doing. So the question is, will the new field-based guide include an English practical how-to on monitoring for spawn, collecting spawn, assisted fertilization, and coral larval rearing? And then I can follow up when you're done. <laughs> Yikes. Um, I don't, there is a little bit in there. There is not that extensive work covering the larval side of things. Um, but we do have a lot of resources available on the CRC website that does talk to larval propagation, um, as well as could put that person in particular in touch with some of our um, former chairs of the larval working group um, if they're really interested. And an update on the guide, really exciting update, is it's currently getting the final like polish and shine and bows on it it's in the graphic design process um, so it is actually really really close to being released um, and hopefully probably something that people might see out within this first quarter um, which is which is very exciting but it is it is more focused on um, mature corals i guess Thanks, Jess. Yeah, and so I was going to follow up with something similar. We do have a few webinars um, from the early days of the CRC that the Larval Propagation Working Group put together, um, and it depends a little bit where you're located for some of the webinars, but one of the very first webinars um, is pretty basic in the sense of um, the tools you need, the processes and things like that to collect spawn in the field. Um, so if you are interested or if that's the level of detail you're looking for, you can um, find that on the CRC website as well. And anybody else want to add anything on that? I'll, I'll just add that that um, webinar that Michelle just spoke about also was turned into an annotated slide deck. And that's all in the larval and propagation, um, or larval propagation section of our um, resources page. You can find that there. Great. Okay, let me, so Jess, um, this question is about regional groups and asking, is there a regional group representation in the Bay, in, Bay of Bengal region, specifically the Eastern region of the Bay? I don't think we have anything there. Um, so if that's of interest, reach out to Jess. <laughs> um, we're excited to get all these things going. Okay, let me see. What else do we have here? Um, this one I can answer. Um, someone asked, where can I get a hold of the Coral Reef Restoration Monitoring Guide? There is an electronic copy. It is um, on our website. We can also, in our follow-up emails, we will do a follow-up email from, um, if you're signed up for the listserv, which is probably how you got the invitation for this webinar, we will do a follow-up email to the listserv and we will put um, all of our important links in there. Um, and any questions we didn't get to, we can address there as well. But that guide is available on our website as well. And there is also a, um, a webinar associated with the launch of that guide. Um, so, um, Michelle, since you just um, took a question, I took a look 
at the questions and there's one that I that I'm gonna go ahead and do if that's okay perfect yeah yeah okay so this is um one of the first questions we got so question is how can we further develop the ability of communities and particular per, sorry let me start again how can we further develop the ability of communities and particularly in least developed countries to have financial autonomy to implement programs without the constant need for external support? How can communities be better guided for economic returns while implementing such restoration programs? Any work or plans to support, to support creating jobs in the field? Okay, so these are, these are some huge questions and really important ones. And I'm gonna add another one onto this list um, from Jessica Carilli. Funding is one thing for projects, but another struggle I'm seeing is that it is unclear who or what entity should be responsible for the long-term responsibility or maintenance for restoration projects, for example, for permits. Has CRC tackled this at all? So I, I think there, in terms of the first question about like long-term economic stability of in not needing external, like constant external resources, this is, it's a really big question and a really big issue. You want your restoration itself to be self-sustaining. And it seems like with the constant threats to coral reefs that that's pretty difficult to do in, in many places. Um, you wanna be really careful about, about where you site um, your restoration project to give it the best chance of success. But of course, even if you site it in the most perfect, pristine reef, you could have a bleaching event that kills those corals. Now, I think it's really important for us to understand and think about what's happening in between bleaching events. Do you have a healthy reef that's supporting a fishery or, or a community? Um, some amount of coral death, first of all, is natural for eons. And, and these days, we have to expect it as part of our kind of long-term process. Um, that's kind of like the big ecological picture. More specifically, there are um, groups like the Global Fund for Coral Reefs that are really focused on trying to make restoration and coral conservation a really sustainable thing for a community. And you know, they're, we're just at the beginning of a lot of their projects, but that really is their goal. And um, we're still trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> it's expensive. It's expensive to restore corals. It's much easier to protect them as they are, but it seems difficult to get governments to protect in the long-term conservation of reefs in a sustainable way. And of course, global warming is making all of that um, very, very difficult. So um, that's the economics issue. I, I was just having a conversation with someone at the Nature Conservancy who's also developing some kind of pilot program to make restoration economically um, sustainable in the um, like for for the longevity of a project and um, in the, the kind of relates to Jessica your question about long-term responsibility um, you know we really do need to think long term for these projects and I would say it's an ongoing issue with with permitting and management and it's something that we're hoping to get more into um, in the coming years but no we have not quite tackled that yet. I want to be respectful of time. It's one minute until the top of the hour. And I want to really thank you guys all for coming and thank my panelists for doing such an excellent job explaining what the CRC is and what we do and how we do it. Um, and um, we will be following up with a recording of this and any questions that we got that we were not able to answer, we will follow up with answers to that as well. And thank you all again, and I hope you tune in again for another webinar.